much as I could to hold off on starting because I was wanting to visit with people because I've been cooped up in my house all week. I don't know about you guys. So, uh, all right, good morning. Welcome. Glad you could be here. Glad that things are beginning to thaw out and looking forward to seeing that continuing over the next couple of days. Uh, please join me in a word of prayer as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Dear God, thank you for each and every person here and thank you for this opportunity to come into this place and worship together as your church. Dear God, I ask that you guide us as we do that this morning, that everything that is said and done is done in a way that's pleasing to you and that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and make us more like Jesus. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Everybody knows this one. Let's sing it like we mean it. announcements this week uh, and most of them are the same as last week so a lot of the stuff I said last week we just pushed back a week because of all the snow so our Wednesday night Bible study class will continue this Wednesday and we should hopefully be able to have it we've had to postpone that for the past two weeks but it'll be 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall so this is week three of our four week study uh, next up Thursday night the women will be back meeting together you know Stephanie got to brag last or last Sunday because Wednesday night canceled the Wednesday before, but the women still met Thursday. Unfortunately, the weather was bad enough that even the women didn't meet this week. So uh, they will be back together this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. If you are still, if you didn't come to the first week and are still interested, I believe that she still has books available to talk to Stephanie if you need any extra information on that. So that will be Thursday at 6.30 p.m. upstairs here. Uh, and then our Valentine's Day. So. Guys, I hope that you were able to find last-minute Valentine's Day plans if you were planning to come to church last Sunday. But now we have a makeup event that you can, not a makeup <laughs> event, you're not putting makeup on, but we are making up for the movie day we had to postpone last Sunday. Tonight at 4.30 p.m., there will be hot dogs, popcorn, candy, door prizes, and we'll be watching the movie I Still Believe. Uh, so please come to that. Please bring your own lawn chair just for comfortable seating uh, so you can be there for the whole event. Doors will open at 4.30. This is provided at no cost to you. So we'd love to have everybody come to that. Uh, the event and some of the stuff is geared towards couples, 
But even if you are not part of a couple, you are more than welcome to come, and you should still have a great time. I believe that's all I have in terms, in terms of announcements. Oh, no, it's not. Young Adult Study. Uh, that was also scheduled to begin this past Friday, but uh, for weather and other reasons, we had to postpone that. So this Friday at 7 p.m., and then I, I didn't update the slide. We are also going to meet upstairs here on this side of the church. So this Friday, 7 p.m. here at the church. Any other announcements that I'm missing? All right, as we look at our theme this week, so we've been talking about being discipleship driven, of who we are as a church. And so our key verse for the week is Matthew 28, 20. Uh, this is part of the Great Commission. This is the second half of it says teaching them so if you remember the first part therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all that i have commanded you and behold i am with you always to the end of the age so part three of this four-part look at these two verses is the commission to teach so we've been commanded to make disciples to baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and now to teach them to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. So one thing that we are here to do as a church, and we do on a weekly basis, is to teach the Word of God, to give understanding of that. Because the better you understand Jesus, the better you can live for Him. It's really simple. Uh, the better you understand what's expected of you and what He desires for you, the, better, the easier it becomes to live that out. So that is a big part of what we are about here as a church, is teaching disciples everything that Jesus has commanded. So with that being said, as we transition into our prayer time, does anyone have any praises they would like to share? Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Awesome. Wonderful. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I'll share a praise on that. This past week, especially, I guess, even before Sunday, uh, we had some issues come up where it's the middle of winter and all of a sudden we started seeing ants in our house, which is terrifying. Uh, and then, lo and behold, last Sunday we went home and our kitchen sink drain was frozen. And so, has anyone ever tried a home remedy to fix frozen pipes? I poured, I, I poured so much... Uh, baking soda and vinegar down our sink to make the fun little volcanoes that it already has me with some fun ideas for parenthood but it didn't work but <laughs> praise god our drain thawed out yesterday and uh the ant problem has been taken care of and it so there was there was a tense <coughs> couple of days as it was really cold but i praise god that he's given us deliverance from all of that so i have to glorify him for that anyone else have anything they'd like to share as far as praises all right how about prayer requests So Billy Laos said that is an ICU, so we'll keep him in prayer. All right. Anyone else? Graham, you got one? Oh, you looked excited. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you out. All right. Well, then, let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much once again for this day. I, I thank you for your church, for what a blessing it is, and how encouraging it is to me as I'm up here talking 90 miles an hour. So, uh. Dear God, I just praise you for this opportunity to come together as your church. I praise you for your grace that you've poured out upon us, that we can have this salvation, that we can be reconciled to you, and that we can then have joy in one another's fellowship. Dear God, I ask that you be with uh, Billy Laos's father and with the whole family as he's in the ICU recovering. Dear God, that you just wrap your arms around them, that you give them grace, that you make this a smooth recovery. And dear God, I ask that you be with the other needs that perhaps were unspoken this morning. Dear God, that you meet them by the power that only you can supply. And dear God, I ask that you be with this church and that you empower us by your Holy Spirit, that you grow us in sanctification, that you mature us, and that you make us effective ministers of your gospel in this world that we live in. And dear God, I ask once again that you use this service to that end. In the mighty name of Jesus. We can't do stand in your love without standing. So let's stand this. <coughs>
standing. We do have another praise too. Eddie's shoulder is healing well from surgery until he went out and shoveled the driveway like his wife told him not to. <laughs> it is. <laughs> they just never listen.
Father, aren't we thankful that all the things that we think we're going through on this earth is really refining us to be a better us, Father. You take us, you shape us, you mold us. And that's my prayer this week, is that we will allow you to do those things and won't think that it's hardship on us, Father, but knowing we will come out better on the end. In your son's precious name I pray, amen. All right, please turn once again to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. That song was very fitting for what we're actually talking about here, because uh, to review, last Sunday we left off at va uh, we left off at verse 14, which, if you'll let me remind you, says, "If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it." Jesus has been talking to his disciples about what is about to happen, but he's trying to comfort them and comfort them in the midst of the fact that he's about to die and that they are about to abandon him and turn away from him. Peter's going to deny him three times. They're all going to flee away from him, and he is literally going to die on the cross. He knows these things are going to happen. He's telling them these things are going to happen, and yet he is telling them, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, uh, if you can put yourself in their shoes, you know, just imagine you were telling... Uh, someone you love very dearly that hey, I'm about to go away In fact, you're gonna watch me die a painful and gruesome death It's going to be terrible for you to watch and in fact to make matters worse You're gonna betray me or you're gonna abandon me shortly before that happens and so But but don't be troubled It puts you in somewhat of an impossible situation, you know, I mean, how, how can you process that? How can you deal with that and say oh, okay? I'm not gonna worry about that. This is about to happen, but this week we're gonna talk about how Jesus can make that a possibility and how he can make that a reality. So if you look at verse 15, segueing into that, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus says, if you love him, you're going to do what he says. And going back to verse 14, as we mentioned, if you love him and are keeping his commandments, it's going to be a lot easier to know what to ask for in his name. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Well, how can you know whether or not what you're asking for is in his name? Well, do you love him? And if you love him, are you keeping his commandments? If you are living for him, you're going to understand him better, and you're going to learn to ask him for the right things. Obedience to what God has already given you will show you how faithful he is. All right, and there's a relationship that works here, and we're going to explain this, and then we're going to get further into the text. So obedience does something. When you are obedient to something that God has given you, something that he has taught you or shown you, and you do what he says, then what happens? Well, God shows up, and he shows you, he gives you understanding of exactly why he wanted you to do that thing. All right, for example, uh, a good example in marriage, with Valentine's Day just being this last week, uh... As I've told you before, anytime I get mad at my wife and God goes to deal with me for that, he never deals with me for anything that she does wrong. Okay, he deals with her for those things. But anytime I'm looking at her and I'm angry at her, God says, okay, well, what about you? What did you do there? He always corrects my behavior and my attitude. And then it's amazing when I learn to die to myself and I surrender my rights and I surrender my will and my way and say, okay, God, I'm going to do it your way. And then I approach my wife with that attitude rather than, hey, you did these things wrong and, you know, I'm here to tell you about it. It's amazing what a different impact it has when I go to her in humility and in surrender to God. And so then what I'm getting at, obedience, once you obey God, you see that, oh, hey, he was right all along. And then you learn. You gain more understanding. And then later down the line, God is going to ask you to take another step of faith and obedience. And then when you do that, he's going to show up and teach you even more. So the relationship works this way. Obedience grows your faith, which then grows your understanding, which then grows your opportunity for obedience, which then grows your understanding and faith and obedience, which grow they build one on top of the other is what I want to get at. It is a self-feeding cycle in which you learn, believe, do, see, learn, believe, do, see, over and over and over again as you grow in obedience to God. So if we love Jesus, we will keep his 
commandments. Church, oftentimes what is missing in a lot of people's spiritual lives is that we're simply not obedient to what God has already given us. We go to church, perhaps you even read your Bible, we pray, we do, we check all the boxes of things we think we're supposed to do, but then sometimes we just forget to apply what Jesus has already given us. And then we expect him to try to teach us something else. You know, uh, I'm going to mention this in Bible study Wednesday as well, but, but speaking of marriage, something funny happened. I mentioned, I, it wasn't funny at the time, but uh, one, one issue that I think some wives have with their husbands, and I'm certainly not immune to this, is that sometimes Kelsey will ask for help around the house. Okay, uh, men, do your wives ever ask you to help around the house? No one else? Okay, you hear that, honey? I can get out of it. I'm just kidding. Okay, we can ask her help around the house. And so there's always plenty of work to do around the house, amen? Always plenty. And so we had this ant problem coming up. There were ants that they were coming out from our fireplace. Most of them were dead, thankfully. But that needed to be cleaned up. And so my wife asked me to help with cleaning up the ant problem. And one of the ways that you can help prevent an ant problem from spreading is to then also do the dishes. Well, as I went to help, I got distracted. Uh, I got distracted doing a good thing, but I got distracted nonetheless. I went back to the medicine cabinet and I realized, oh, some of these medicines are expired. I'm going to go through and clean all of this up. Okay, now, now it seems kind of funny, but, but this, is, this is real life, okay? There was something that I needed to do that, that Kelsey wanted me to help her out with, and I was helping. She couldn't say I wasn't doing anything, but what I was doing wasn't actually helping the situation. And that's sometimes how we are with God. Sometimes with God, he says, hey, I want to work on this in your life. I want to work on this in your heart. I want to fix this. And we say, yeah, but that looks really difficult, God. Here, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to go over. Yeah, you might want to work on my character there, but I'm going to go on a mission trip. I'm going to serve you, God, over there. Oh, I'm going to join the worship team. I'm going to sing for you, God. Oh, God, I'm going to. We try to substitute what God actually wants us to do with what we want to do that's more convenient. That's what I was doing in chores, and that's sometimes what we do with God. And so, quite simply, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The Pharisees would try to go and reach people in far-off lands so they could brag about it. But they wouldn't actually focus on obeying God. It was all about show. They wanted to look like they were working hard. Okay, one last metaphor before we move on to this. In sports, okay, uh, in, in track, when I was in school, there was something called... I, I don't know what the technical term was, but they, they would call it the fat man run in track, okay, where these people who are usually offensive linemen in football who are really big guys would then get out and run usually a 400-meter dash or something like that. And there was, a, there was a man I went to school with, a boy, we were boys at the time, that he was a big kid and he was slow, but when he would run that run, he would be the slowest one, but he would keep going, and the crowd would get so excited, and they would cheer for him, because, oh, look at that heart he's showing. Look how hard of a worker he was. But that same man, when he was in the weight room, was not a very hard worker. He was only a hard worker when people were watching him. Okay? Once again, this is a lot of what fake religiosity is compared to what Jesus would actually have us do. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But before we get into this next part, we need to go to the Lord in prayer. Because I, I, need, I need his help to say everything I'm going to say. But, but even more so with what we're about to talk about. Because it gets into some uh, just really big theology. So let's go to the Lord in prayer with me. Dear God, I thank you for your word. And I ask that you give us all understanding of this word. That we might take it and do exactly what you've said. That we might apply it. That we might be obedient. And that we might see your grace shine through that. And that you might glorify your name in our lives and through our lives. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus has given us something that in our own flesh would be impossible to do. How can we keep his commandments? Now, you can probably testify with me on this. It is really hard to be obedient to God at times. Amen? When that person cuts you off in traffic, it is hard to love your neighbor as yourself. It is much easier to get angry and say some things that you're glad your pastor is not there to hear. But Jesus is going to give us this answer to obedience. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Jesus is going to ask God to give us a counselor, a helper. Uh, other words that can be used 
to, to communicate this Greek word here uh, is, is an advocate, an intercessor. A helper is a really good word for this, because what it is, is this assists us in the aforementioned process of loving him and keeping his commands. Jesus says, I'm going to go away, but I am going to ask the Father, and he is going to send you another helper. And if you'll notice, that word helper is capitalized. Who is this talking about? Who is Jesus talking about? The Holy Spirit, verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. There's quite a bit to this verse itself. Jesus is obviously speaking of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, but if you will remember back to verse 6 of this same chapter, Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You remember that? Okay, so here Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, he says, even the spirit of truth. Does anybody know what the word spirit, a synonym for the word spirit in the Old and New Testament? Anybody want to take a guess at it? Ghost? Ghost is a synonym of it, yes. But there's another one as well. When, when God put the spirit of life into man all the way back in Genesis, it says he breathed into his nostrils. The word spirit can also actually be translated as breath. And that's going to be important for the uh, mental image I want to try to paint for you here shortly. Okay, Spirit, someone's breath can be compared to their spirit. The Holy Spirit can be compared to a wind at times. Okay, You know that feeling you get of goosebumps? It's not always the Holy Spirit when you get goosebumps, but... Sometimes it is the Holy Spirit moving upon you when you feel that almost like a, a non-physical wind coming over you. The word spirit can be translated as breath or wind or air. All right? So Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus mentions that he is the truth. So if the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, in one sense we could say that he is the breath of truth. But what I want to show you on this is that the Son has already talked about how he is united with the Father in previous verses. We looked at that last week. He says, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is also one with the Son and also one with the Father. So if Jesus is the truth and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, they are therefore united. That makes sense? That's pretty simple. All right. So the Spirit is united with the Son, who is united with the Father, and this is how we get the word Trinity. Three in one, one in three. They are all the Godhead, but they are all different parts of the Godhead. They are one in being and in purpose, but they also are varied in their purpose and in their function. Now, uh, this, is, this is overall inadequate, because... The thing I'm talking to you about is very mysterious and hard to understand. But if I can make a comparison to something else to help us understand the Trinity a little bit, it would be our own lives. In the sense that there are three major players in keeping you alive at any given time. Now, there are a lot of other functions going on in your body, and your other organs are important. But there are three major ones that if they stop working, you will have immediate bad consequences. And the three I want to talk about are your brain, your heart, and your breath. So your lungs, I suppose, in that. Your brain is your command center. It sends the messages to where they need to go, and it through your nervous system, it, it sends the commands. The heart pumps the blood to make sure that there are the nutrients there for, for uh, your body to do what it needs to do. And your breath, likewise, assists in giving your body the nutrients, which it transfers to the blood. And it's just this beautiful, chaotic system. It's not chaotic. It's quite peaceable how it works, actually. But it's this wonderful system that all works together with each different part providing a certain function. In this, if we want to look at the Trinity this way, God the Father would be easiest described as the brain. He's the decision maker. He transmits the information to the rest of the body. Jesus would be best described as the heart. He pumps the blood throughout the body, and the, the Holy Spirit would be symbolized as the breath. And, and when I say that, I, I want you to understand, breath is something that is quite mysterious. Breath is something that can be both passive and active. 
When you guys came in here, you were all breathing, but I don't think you were really thinking about breathing. It was something that was just happening automatically. But now that I'm talking about breathing, you're probably very aware of your own breath. It's something that's both passive and active. It's something that's both invisible and visible. You can see your lungs moving in the breathing process, but you can't actually see the air coming in and out of your mouth. Breathing is something mysterious. It's something hard to fully understand when there are issues with breathing. You know that there are issues, but you can't always identify what those issues are. Breathing through a mask is harder than breathing without a mask, amen? Okay, and if it's not, how much is your mask actually doing? Breath is incredibly important to our survival, and it's something that you would notice more quickly than if your breath was cut off, you'd probably notice that even more quickly than a heart attack. You'd probably notice it even more quickly than if your brain was having issues. You'd notice those things shortly thereafter, but breath is 100% necessary to survival, but breath is also immediately visible and invisible. It's quite mysterious, and that's why I don't mind it being used to describe the Holy Spirit, because today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity, who is absolutely essential and important to living out this faith, but it is one of the most ununderstood or the misunderstood being of the Trinity within the church. It is, uh, he is sometimes abused, he is sometimes neglected, and God has given us, Jesus has sent us the spirit of truth for great purposes. And we cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand him as best as we can today. All three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together towards the same goal. But they have different functions in doing so. As I said, Jesus is the truth and the Holy Spirit is the breath of truth. Jesus has been speaking to them about comfort after warning them about all these terrible things that are about to happen. And the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is the active agent who will distribute that comfort. Also in this verse, it says, Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, we need to know that the Holy Spirit is not accessible to unbelievers or to the world. The Holy Spirit is not knowable to the world. The world can see the results of the actions of the Holy Spirit, but they cannot understand the Holy Spirit himself. He's not there for the world, but you know him. Jesus was talking to his apostles, but this applies to us. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit can be known, can be understood by believers, but he is understood through practice. It does take time to understand the Holy Spirit, because I will tell you, and I will shout it loudly if you need me to, there are people out there doing things that they say are in the name of the Holy Spirit that are not doing them in the name of the Holy Spirit. There, and it is easy to get caught up in some of those things at times that are actually falsehoods, that they're not uh, they're not actually the Holy Spirit. There are other spirits. They're spiritual, but they are not the Holy Spirit. How can I say that so emphatically? Because the Holy Spirit is one with Jesus and is one with God. And so the Holy Spirit is going to do things that line up with the will of God and line up with the word of God. If someone says that it's the Holy Spirit doing something that directly contradicts what the word of God says, it's not the Holy Spirit. Because he's going to stay true to the word and going to stay true to God. Okay? But... Like anything else, the more you learn that, the better you can understand and apply it. Now, at this time, when this was written, a little bit more in this verse, it says the Holy Spirit dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit has been active since the book of Genesis. You know, even in the first two verses, it says the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Okay, the Holy Spirit has been active. He has anointed different leaders in Israel's history. He had been observable in a way, but Jesus talks about something different that was going to happen to the apostles. He dwells with you and will be, future tense, in you. When was that fulfilled? At Pentecost. You know, a lot of time, the times when Jesus was saying certain things at this time, the disciples just did not get it. They wanted to understand. They were genuine. They were trying, but it was just not clicking. 
It's amazing how many things clicked for Peter on the day of Pentecost. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit does at giving us understanding. When the Holy Spirit comes to indwell the life of the believer, all of a sudden, a light switch goes on. All of a sudden, a lot of things that have been perplexing, that have been confusing or frustrating, start to make sense. You know, Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Christmas wasn't that long ago. Remember that? God with us. The Holy Spirit is God in us. It's amazing how this works. Let's go to verse 18, because there's so much more to get to here. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Though he had already prophesied to, him, to them about his death on multiple occasions, he wanted them to know that him leaving earth was not him abandoning them. In fact, he says, I will come to you. And he could be talking about two different things there. He could be talking about when he's going to come back, as he talked about last week. But if he's just talking about the Holy Spirit in the previous verse, what do you think he's talking about here? Probably the Holy Spirit. But he says, I will come to you. Just as he said to Philip last week, hey, you, I've been with you this whole time. You don't recognize me when he says, show us the Father. Jesus is one with the Father and one with the Holy Spirit. So you can use those terms interchangeably at times. If you pray, who are you praying to? We say in Jesus' name, but are you praying to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? Typically, you're praying to the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. They're all involved in it, but you just simply say, dear God. Or you can say Heavenly Father. Or anything. But if you're talking to God, any of the three qualifies. Okay? It's all the same. They have different functions. They have different purposes. But it's all pointing towards the same overall goal. Okay? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you says, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. So Jesus says, in just a little while, speaking of his death, he would become invisible to the rest of the world, but visible to believers. How does that happen? Quite simply, this happens through the Holy Spirit. They will see him because he is one with the Spirit, and one with the Father. A body, okay, Jesus, when he was on this earth, a body can only be in one place at a given time. Jesus didn't appear in Israel, in the United States, or, or in Independence, Missouri, as some believe. He didn't appear in all these different places. He lived his life in Israel. He died in Israel, and he was raised in Israel. A body can only be at one place at a given time, but the Spirit can be everywhere okay now we don't have to just borrow the holy spirit for our church service and then send him down the road to the next church the holy spirit can be all over the place can be omnipresent all present this is why jesus said last week that it was good that he was going to the father and that they would do greater works than these than, than what he had done because he was going to be going to the right hand of the father and the holy spirit would be coming here which is God still on this earth, living in the lives of believers, reaching out to the entirety of the world. And because he lives, he mentions, speaking of his resurrection that was to come, we will live too. But how is that life transmitted to us? But through the Holy Spirit. You know, if you die... You will be raised again, and you will be raised again bodily. You will have a body. You will not just be a ghost or an angel. There are some churches, or there are a lot of Christians who believe that when you die, you become an angel. That's not what the Word of God says. Now, you will live on in spirit when your body passes on, but that's not even your final destination. When Jesus returns, you will return in a body, a new resurrected body that doesn't age, that doesn't get sick, that doesn't feel pain, a glorious body. But even now, eternal life doesn't start after you die. Eternal life starts as soon as you believe, and it is transmitted through the working of the Holy Spirit. Like I said, some of these things can be difficult to understand or they can be uncomfortable, but this is 100% essential for us to know and understand. Because I live, you also will live. 
The world won't see me, but you will see me. This is all done through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the active working agent of the Godhead in this present age. God the Father is in heaven, sending the command, sending the mission. Okay? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, preparing a place for us. And the Holy Spirit is at work in us, preparing us for that place. Verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Through the Holy Spirit, we enter into the unity that is found between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which makes sense of the marriage metaphor that Jesus has been using. When Jesus comes back, we will be united with God the Father and Christ the Son in person, but in the meantime, through the Holy Spirit, we become united with God in spirit. United with his purposes and his plan, in tune with his desires, and empowered to do the things he would have us to do. Ask me anything in my name and surely I will do it. Those are the words of Jesus. Okay, well how, how can we ask in his name? How can we know what we should ask? All by the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Your love is shown through your actions. Your love is shown through your works. Are you saved by works? No. You're saved by faith, by grace through faith. But then the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, and you are compelled towards good works. That's what happens. The Holy Spirit yearns jealously for you. And if you are spending, if you are treating people wrongly and the Holy Spirit's living in you, if you are doing things that are ungodly and sinful, what happens? Hopefully you feel convicted. Oh, that hurts. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is prompting you and saying, hey, I don't want that for you. That's bad for you. I want you to come out of that. I want to lead you out of that. Unfortunately, at times, we respond just like Adam and Eve responded in the garden. We become ashamed. We become afraid and we try to hide. But no, what the Holy Spirit is there for is to comfort you, to convict you, but then to teach you how to come out, to give you deliverance from that. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, keeps them, he it is who loves me. We can only keep the commandments of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Once again, Peter, on this very night, loved Jesus very much but was going to turn his back on him and deny him three times. Peter, after he had been indwelt by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, still made mistakes. Okay, we see that Paul and Peter had an argument because Peter was being a coward in a certain way. But by the end of his life, Peter was willing to be crucified upside down for Jesus. Okay, he didn't abandon him. He didn't deny him three times. He, all of a sudden, he loved God more than he loved his own flesh. He loved Jesus more than he loved his own life. How did that happen? It happened through the Holy Spirit teaching him over the course of time. It was this progressive act of sanctification, but that comes through obedience. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What does manifest mean? Appear to him, show up to him. Now, does that mean you're going to see Jesus... In a bodily form, like as a ghost, not necessarily, but through the Holy Spirit, you can sense the presence of the Holy Spirit and of God and of Jesus. You can, you can just sense it. Sometimes when you're singing a song, this is the best way to feel it. Okay, when I was reading through this passage, of course, there's an obvious song that comes up uh, in verse 19. Because I live, you also will live. I was reading this and all of a sudden, song it, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That came into that song that flips my heart because sometimes life gets really tough but because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives I can cast out all fear because I know he holds the future life is worth living because he lives you can feel that in your bones so to speak by the Holy Spirit and this unity that Jesus has been talking about in verse 20 it's shown through obedience and righteousness of action and once again let me illustrate this relationship one more time for you if you believe you obey okay sometimes people don't obey because they don't really believe all right uh, in in sports if your coach tells you to do something you say hey here is the way to find success and then you try something else anyways it's because you don't really believe that your coach knows what he's talking about we would never say that out loud, but 
But in basketball, this was a big problem. You know, a lot of people who coach basketball, because uh, I coach some basketball, they told me I should really consider coaching girls basketball. They said all of them who had done that, who had switched from coaching boys to coaching girls, would never go back to coaching boys. Here's the reason why. So if there are any boys basketball players, just try to listen to them the best you can right now. Girls do a better job of working together towards a common goal. Guys, you can tell them we're going to run this play or that play, but the male ego says, yeah, I know we're supposed to do that, but I want to be the hero. And so then, even though I'm supposed to pass the ball and let the offense do its work, no, I'm going to try to do these fancy dribble moves and try to act like I'm Steph Curry and just shoot it over somebody. Oh, it clanks off the rim or I airball it, and then I have to go sit on the bench. All right? If you believe, you obey. That applies far better in Christianity than it does in sports. If you believe that God is who he says he is and that Jesus actually knows what he's talking about, you're going to endeavor to do what he says. If you don't obey, it's because you don't really believe it. You just think it's all a joke or you think he doesn't really know what he's talking about. There are a lot of churches now who are completely abandoning teachings of God. Why is that? Well, they don't think he's really God. They think that they're God. Hey, we get to decide what is moral. We have evolved past certain commands that God has given. No, he's God. He's the boss. We either obey him if we believe him or you don't believe him and you need to stop using his name because he's not actually your God. But if we love him, we will keep his commandments. And as you obey, what's going to happen is God will manifest himself to you. He will show up and you will see him at work through that obedience. And that is going to motivate you. Your faith is going to grow. And then your belief, as it grows, you're going to obey more. And then as you continue to obey, you're going to grow and you're going to see. And it just keeps building and building. You gain confidence through the right place. Once I learned that my coaches actually knew what they were talking about, I was a really good, obedient basketball player. We ran the flex. Anybody know what the flex is in basketball? Oh, I hated running the flex. <sighs> because I couldn't play hero ball. I had to just pass the ball and set a screen and run and make my cuts. And it was not a very uh, showcasey type of basketball. It was simple, but it worked. Once you believe, then you start to obey. And that's... In sports, you call that buying in. Once players start to buy in, things work a lot better. In life, you call that obedience. Children in the home. It's amazing. Kids, we always think when we're kids that we know better, right? Your parents tell you to do something. You're like, no, no, no. I clearly know better than that. No? Anybody? That was me. And my dad has resorted to this point to tell me, I know you're going to do whatever you want to do anyways, but here's my advice, right? The more you believe, the more you trust God, the more you're going to obey him, and then you're going to see that he actually does know what he's talking about. He's going to grow your faith and grow your obedience, and it's just a self-feeding and self-growing relationship. Verse 22, Judas, I'm going to make sure to specify, not Iscariot, because Judas Iscariot was out from their presence at the time, actively betraying Jesus, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? This is another funny one to me, honestly, because sometimes Jesus won't directly answer a question right away. If you remember a couple chapters ago, they said, hey, some Greeks want to see you. And Jesus mostly ignores the question and goes on teaching them. Okay, he's going to do the same thing here. He says, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Here's Jesus' response. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He is going to answer them here, but it's just not direct yet. Judas said, how are you going to show yourself to us but not the world? Jesus says, love me, keep my word, and my Father will love you, and we will come to you and make our home with you. Okay? He begins to lay a foundation. He says, whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Church, if we change our morals to fit with the world around us, it is because we love the world more than we love God. All right? That's plain and simple. And I'll, I'll leave that at that. Right? Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. If we love Jesus, we keep his words and we become obedient to them. And if we do that, God will come up and show himself to us. He will give us his presence. He will give us his blessings and his favor. Verse 25 is where he gives them a direct answer. And 26. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So basically what Jesus says is, hey, you just, they say, he, 
uh, Judas said, how, how are you going to show us, show yourself to us, but not the world? And he says, hey, all you need to worry about right now is trusting me. You trust me, you keep my word. When the Holy Spirit comes, then it will make sense to you. Jesus says, I've thrown a lot of information at you right now. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to make it all make sense, and he's going to remind you of everything that I've said. He basically said, be patient and wait, and you will understand one day. You're not going to understand yet. Looking back now, when we look at the book of Acts, we can tell, we can see how this works. Amen? We can see how the Lord can reveal himself to his people, but not to the rest of the world. But when they were looking forward, they couldn't understand it yet. And he said, just trust me, just have faith, just believe, and then you will see. As I've said plenty of times before, in Missouri we're called the show me state. We say, show me and then I'll believe. It works the opposite direction with God. Believe and obey, and then he will show you. Now that could sound to you like a Ponzi scheme, but I promise you it's not. He does indeed show you. But the thing is, what he wants to build in you, more than just about anything else, is faith and trust. And so for him to build your faith and to build your trust, you have to take steps in that faith. If he says, here, I'm going to show you the whole path so that it's really easy and you can walk down it. You don't have to have faith to walk down that path. So he says, here, trust me, take a step. You take a step. Oh, I'm still safe. Things are going well. Okay, now, now I can take another step. That's the work of faith. That's what he wants to build in you. It requires patience. It requires obedience. But he does reveal himself. It is not something that is just without evidence. It is something that he does show up. Likewise, if we were to ask just about any question, but perhaps God has called you to a certain area of ministry, and you say, God, how am I supposed to do this? How can I do this or that? And you see, it is impossible because we think we're inadequate. His answer is still the same. If you love me, trust me, keep my word. And the Holy Spirit's going to give you the means and the understanding to do whatever it is he's calling you to do. I promise. As we get ready to close here, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Jesus alludes to two different kinds of peace. First one is peace as the world gives. Let's call this world peace. And the second is called his peace, the peace of Christ. World peace... You heard that phrase before, world peace? All world peace is, is the absence of conflict between wars. World peace is always something that is temporary. There's tension that is building that, hey, we're at peace right now, but we just got to make sure we don't offend anybody and we don't hurt anybody's feelings so that we can remain at peace. It's always temporary and it's always tense. It's not true peace. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The peace of Christ persists in the midst of conflicts. It is a comfort that can be received no matter how difficult your circumstances are, but it is a comfort that is only found through the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Verse 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. When you go to the funeral of a righteous person, you do not feel sorry for them. They're going to be with the Father. They're going to be with Jesus. They're going to glory. We mourn for ourselves, but it's a great benefit to the believer to be able to do exactly what Jesus was about to do in this story. You know, we've had a number of funerals here in the past couple years, and, and there's always sorrow at them, but I've been so privileged to be able to do funerals for such righteous and godly people. Because there's always a rejoicing on their part. If they've been suffering, if they've been going through difficulty, to know that they're not in pain and that they now get to be with God and get to be with Jesus. Verse 29, And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Jesus had to inform them of this time and time again because when he went to the cross, there is no doubt they were going to think that, oh no, God's plan has been thwarted. Says, no, I'm telling you all this stuff so that when it happens, you will understand that this has been the plan all along. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. And then he says, rise and let us go from here. The ruler of this world in this sense is Satan. How does Satan rule this world? He rules through death. And the fear of death. He rules to the power of 
fear. Death comes through sin, and Jesus is without sin, and therefore he has no claim on Jesus because death has no power over him. Fear has no grip on him. Satan has nothing that he can use against Jesus. But Jesus was going to go and prove that Satan had no power over him. He was going to prove that death had no power over him. And he was going to prove that he loved the Father by being 100% obedient and faithful to him. To show us something that defies nature, sin, the grave, and Satan. And so as we get to the end of this chapter, Jesus also tells the apostles, rise up, let us go. Okay? Where are they about to go? They're going to go to Gethsemane, and then Jesus is going to be arrested, and this whole chain of events is going to start that's leading to his death. Jesus wasn't running from that. He's teaching them, and he says, hey, let's go. He's ready to face it. He's ready to be obedient. Likewise, are you ready to be obedient? And you could shout yes and all that stuff, and I would be really excited, but that's, that's not what this is about. If you just get excited about it today, that doesn't mean that you're actually ready to be obedient. Jesus has provided an amazing salvation for us. He's provided an amazing life for us, and he delivers all of it to us by the Holy Spirit. And so the real question is this, or not even a question yet. Some are afraid of the Holy Spirit because we live in a material world. The worldview around us teaches you that the only things that exist are things that you can see, touch, hear, smell, taste, all of that. If you cannot observe it, if you cannot study it or comprehend it from a scientific standpoint, it does not exist. And so therefore we say, oh, anything spiritual I just want to avoid because that's scary. There are some churches that do that. I'm not talking about the world right now. I'm talking about the church. There are some churches who want to deny any sort of work of the Holy Spirit. They want to take away any gifts that they can, any acts of the Spirit, because we say, oh no, that's scary. That doesn't make sense to me. There are a lot of times that the Holy Spirit will not make sense to you. There are a lot of times that God won't make sense to you. He will ask you to do things that do not make sense on the surface, because he's wanting you to act out in faith, and then he's going to show up. But then there are some who are afraid of the Holy Spirit because of other reasons. Because others have done wicked things by other spirits claiming to be the Holy Spirit. I've been to certain Pentecostal churches that consider themselves to be spiritual. But really what is going on in there is ungodly. Okay, they call it the Holy Spirit, but I've watched a video of a man shrieking in pain that this church called the Holy Spirit was in it. He's shrieking in pain and screaming like he's demon possessed. Probably because he is, to be honest. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be a benefit to you. He's not there to destroy you or cause you to go insane or anything like that. That does not sound like the work of the Holy Spirit. That does not sound like Jesus. That does not sound like God. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. But if you're afraid from either direction here, what we need to understand is that the Holy Spirit of God is 100% essential to the Christian life. So we need to overcome that fear. But how do you overcome that fear? Well, that's the thing. The Holy Spirit is going to be united with Jesus and going to be united with God the Father. So the more you dive into the Word of God and you can understand the Father and the Son, the more you're going to understand the Holy Spirit and the more you're going to be able to live by Him. The Holy Spirit of God is, in fact, who makes the Word of God come to life. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us. We have many who are afraid to step out into ministry, to step out into obedience, and to actually do the things that God has given us to do, simply because we're afraid to access the power source to do all of it. The Holy Spirit is the only way that we can do the work of God. Because we're inadequate on our own. And so a lot of us would rather sit in that inadequacy and just say, oh, well, God can't use me. And we consider that humility when really it's fear and or laziness. If God wants you to do something, he will empower you to do it. And the agent he will use to empower you is the Holy Spirit. So I just have something simple to say to you. If you believe in Jesus Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Pray to the Lord that you will receive the Spirit and watch what He does. Watch what happens. It will make the Word of God come to life. It will make your faith come to life. It will make your obedience come to life. You will be a blessing to everyone you're around as it grows in you. You will still make mistakes, but you will grow in this salvation. I have a question I don't want you to raise your hands to. But this is what I'm closing with, I promise. I know I've preached a little bit long this morning. Sorry, I've been cooped up in my house all week. All right? I have a question for you. In this life, it's easy to become afraid. In this life, it is easy for us to be downcast. My question is this. To any of you, once again, don't raise your hand. Does the Christian life seem hard? Does the Christian life seem impossible? Does it seem draining? Does it seem like something that is wearing you out? Something that is just getting harder and harder, and perhaps you're struggling to even keep the faith? Okay, that's, that's question one. Here's question two that goes with that. Do you think that is how God designed the Christian life to be? No. The Christian life is supposed to be joy unspeakable and full of glory. Christian life is supposed to be victory, that we are supposed to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. Christian life is supposed to be a victorious life. So if those two aren't adding up, if you are feeling discouraged, if you are feeling down, if you are feeling like just giving up, where do you turn to? Turn to God himself. By the Holy Spirit, he will start to encourage you. By the Holy Spirit, he will point you towards him. He will grow your obedience, which will grow your faith, which will grow your obedience, which will grow your faith, and you will glorify him every step of the way. Join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Dear God, I admit that this has been an area of struggle in my life at times. Because I've been to a variety of churches who have lots of different things to say about your Holy Spirit. Dear God, and I've seen it abused. I've seen it blasphemed. But I've seen it avoided. And dear God, we cannot avoid your Holy Spirit if we want to be used by you at all. Because we are inadequate in our flesh. Only by your Holy Spirit can we do anything for your kingdom. So dear God, I ask that you free us of that fear and dear God, that you give us an understanding, that you give us a comprehension of the Holy Spirit. That, Lord, you might send your Holy Spirit on us to empower us to do the work that you've called us to do. For, for as we've read in, in our theme this morning, you have called us to make disciples. You haven't suggested that we make disciples. You've commanded us to make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. So, dear God, we simply ask for the strength and the power to do just that. And I ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. If our musicians would come as we prepare for communion, this all adds together here. Okay, God the Father sent the Son to die on the cross. By the death of Jesus on the cross, the temple, the veil was torn in two that we might have access to the Holy of Holies. And that access comes through the Holy Spirit. So when you go to take of the elements after, after prayer here, do this in mind of that whole process. Okay, do this in remembrance of Jesus and in looking forward to his coming and in preparation for the work of the kingdom. Dear God, be with this church. Set a fire in our souls, O oh God, and fan the flames that, Lord, we might be zealous for your kingdom, that we might have the love of Christ shine out through us in all that we say and do. I ask in the great name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
As we prepare to leave here, I uh, just want to remind you, if you need somebody to talk to about any of this, if you need someone to pray with you, I'm always available. Just, just let me know. Um, but let me remind you of this verse one last time as we leave. So he's called us to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Dear God, I ask that you be with us as we go from this place. Dear God, teach us to become obedient, to, to not just learn, but then to apply our learning to our lives, dear God, that people might see our good works and glorify you. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Have a blessed week.